Thank you very much. It's very nice, very, very nice to be back in London and to see so many familiar faces and really um, feel, always feel a great sense of buzz when I arrive in this uh, city. Uh, the even coming out of a pretty buzzy city in uh, New York. Uh, I'm conscious that you've been sitting patiently for some time, but um, I'll interpret in a relatively brief way the offer to do a keynote lecture. That says to me that I remember when I was at university, the definition of a lecture was the, the passing of the notes of the lecturer to the notes of the student without going through the minds of either. And I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll try and avoid just plowing through, but I, I know people are going to have um, questions. Uh, I was asked to speak for about 20 minutes about the European refugee crisis, which is actually a global refugee crisis, and try and apply the lens of this report um, in thinking about it. But two things struck me just listening to the, to the two presentations we've had. One is that the shift in the balance of power from institutions, be they governmental or businesses, to individuals, what I call the civilian surge, which you see in countries democratic and non-democratic. Remember, every government, whether it's in a democracy or in an autocracy, lives in coalition with its own people. And the lesson of Egypt, 2011, is that even an autocracy lives in coalition with its own people. Uh, that civilian surge is gaining momentum, and the ability for people to communicate, to organize, is unparalleled. And the fact that it's added, or the fact that it's part of a global trend towards higher levels of education, never mind higher levels of information flow, only fuels, I would argue, it's rising education that is the greatest fuel uh, for the uh, kind of civilian empowerment that is, I think, described in the, some of the presentations, or is it implied at. And the second thing, though, is that uh, uh, the message I took away for, for leaders, whether they're in politics or in business or in NGOs, is that there is no, there's no communications answer to the problems that exist. So for politics, uh, the, uh, there's no political answer without a policy answer. And one of my reflections about the global challenge that exists for politicians of the centre-right and the centre-left is that fundamentally, the reason that the extremes are being empowered is that the answers of centre-right and centre-left are perceived by too many people not to be good enough for the problems that exist. On the centre-right, you see that in the US at the moment, where the central demand of voters is to preserve the social order, sometimes called social conservatism, and leaders of the centre-right are being outflanked on the harder right. And the central demand of leaders on the centre-left is obviously to use the tools of government and the alliance of government and private sector to tackle problems like inequality. And what people are essentially saying, I think, in the data is they want better answers to those challenges. And so when we say politics has got to be about answers, not just anger, or when I used to say politics has got to be about answers, not just anger, then uh, there's, there's real challenge built into that. Because the challenges of conserving social order if you're on the center right, or of tackling inequality on the center left, which are the central demands in a way of what voters on center right and center left ask of their leaders, those are very hard questions. And trying to pretend you've got an answer when you, without the substance, I think the recipe, I think that would, that, that there's obviously huge issues there. And I, I want to try and weave that notion of a civilian surge on the one hand, and of answers not just uh, anger on uh, the other, try and weave that through a discussion of the refugee crisis and what, um, what it portends and what it demands, because I think the demands of it are very, very significant. This is the argument I was going to make about the refugee crisis. First of all, it's caused by deep, secular, long-term global trends. The implosion in the Islamic world, the weakness of about 25 to 30 states around the world who struggle to meet basic needs and to fulfill or and to uh, keep the differences amongst their own population within peaceful boundaries. The weakness and division of the international political system. In some ways, a weaker international political system, certainly than any, than any time since the end of the Cold War, and in some ways uh, for longer. Those are three deep, long-term trends. So the refugee crisis, I would argue, is here to stay. Secondly, the refugee crisis causes political instability, as well as being a reflection of political instability. And traditionally, I guess when I went into the humanitarian sector two years ago, one's 
the obvious equation is that political instability and conflict leads to humanitarian crisis. But the line of causation also moves from humanitarian crisis to political instability. And central to my mind in that is not actually Germany. Just think about the situation in the Middle East, where countries like Lebanon and Jordan are coping with, with a refugee population 10 or 20% of their total population. Uh, think of the, popula of the situation in Kenya, which for many years has dealt with hundreds of thousands of Somalis. Think of the Afghan-Pakistan situation. The line of causation doesn't just run from instability to crisis, it runs from crisis to instability. Um, and the third thing I was going to try and argue is that we need some, very, we need some new responses to the scale of the refugee humanitarian crisis that exists around the world. And uh, I'll offer those reflections from the distinctive viewpoint of a global NGO uh, founded by Albert Einstein in 1933 when he fled to New York from Germany. Uh, an NGO which is, I think it's fair to say, actually unique in the following way. We are both an international humanitarian relief agency. So we work in 30 countries. There are 22,000 uh, staff of the IRC working today, uh, helping. Last year, we helped 23 million people with health, education, protection for women and kids, economic uh, livelihood support. But we're also a refugee resettlement agency. Since Einstein's day, we now resettle 10,000 new refugees into the US every year in 26 US cities. So we can see the arc of crisis from the war zone to the neighboring states, to the fragile, to the uh, transit routes, and then to refugee uh, resettlement. And I think it's worth just pausing and recognizing the extraordinary global nature of people flows as a result of conflict. 60 million people last year displaced from their homes by conflict. Uh, 40 million internally displaced, that means they're staying within their own country, 20 million refugees displaced across borders. And Syria is the poster child for this scale of uh, tumult. Um, that's why it was on the video. 7 million internally displaced, 4.5 million refugees, 13.5 million still in need of humanitarian help inside uh, the country. And to some of us, not surprisingly, those problems have eventually spilled out of the Middle East and spilled into Europe. More than a million people arrived last year, more than half of them from Syria, but 20% of them from Afghanistan. And I guess the important point for the context we're meeting today is that the chaotic policy response that has existed in Europe over the last um, couple of years is makes the Europe crisis a microcosm, not just for the reasons that people flee, but also for the kind of response that refugees and displaced people traditionally, uh, conventionally find. Desperate people risking their lives, uh, getting round the authorities rather than um, working with them, and relying on an ill-coordinated policy response, because certainly sitting in New York, that's what the European response has seemed. Uh, and I think it's worth asking, I mean, how did we end up in a situation where the Pope says in 2014 that the, the failure of European response to the refugee crisis represents, quote unquote, the globalization of indifference? It's an extraordinary, extraordinarily resonant phrase, the globalization of indifference. Essentially, he was pointing the finger at all of us and saying the central feature of globalization is not prosperity, opportunity, it's actually a, a failure of compassion. Now, the, the, the striking thing is after he said it, nothing happened in 2014. Uh, the, the prime ministers of Greece and Italy were jumping up and down saying, this is a major crisis for our countries, but it was convenient for the rest of Europe not to uh, respond and not to help. And so I think that it's worth understanding that the causes of the chaotic and unsuccessful uh, policy response to the refugee crisis have both structural elements that are deep-seated and contingent elements that were just a matter of policy of failure. The structural ones are worth understanding, I think. One, it was, uh, it's 10 times harder or 100 times harder to solve a problem if you start late. And the fact that there were already half a million refugees in Germany 
in, or probably more actually, 600,000 refugees in Germany by the middle of last year meant that Mrs. Merkel and the rest of Europe, frankly, were playing catch up. So the late start sets you up to be playing away from home in a very, very difficult situation. I would argue that the breakdown of talks between Turkey and the EU uh, four and a half years ago, four or five years ago, uh, has also contributed to the scale of the crisis. Euro uh, Turkey turned away from Europe. Europe turned away from Turkey in 2011 and have been talking past each other until we desperately needed each other uh, just at the end of last year. Uh, I would also say that the failure to uphold the laws of war inside Syria, the failure of accountability for those who are committing war crimes inside Syria, and the fact that multiple war crimes are then committed, has undoubtedly been an incredible driver of people flows. Um, I, I, th those pictures on Lesbos in, in Greece, when I, uh, it, the most surprising thing for me when I went to Lesbos in September was the number of people who'd come straight from Syria. I, I hadn't picked this up, but there were graduate students at the University of Damascus saying they were being drafted into Assad's army and they didn't want to commit war crimes. There were people saying, look, I had Assad bombing with barrel bombs, I've got ISIS around the corner and now the Russians are bombing too. And people were leaving direct from Syria. So the failure of civilian protection, I think, inside Syria. But there have also been some contingent uh, problems. The absence of a legal route to Europe has empowered the smugglers. The people smugglers pro prosper when there isn't a legal route to hope. 1,200 euros a person, 600 for kids and babies uh, is the current going uh, rate. Uh, weak support for the neighbors of Syria who bear the greatest load. Um, Jordan and Lebanon, uh, most obviously. And I think a, a rose-tinted hope that the war would end, sometimes fueled by people from within the Middle East. And in a way, you've got a perfect recipe for the collapse of trust in those structural and contingent uh, circumstances I've described. Um, what needs to happen? I mean, the obvious point, and this is why I raised, made the point at the beginning that we as IRC work both in the war zones and we do work on resettlement, is that you have to tackle the, the, the symptoms and the causes together. And um, I think that that's, that's hard, but it's, it's the only plausible narrative to tell about how you're going to get to grips with the scale of the uh, problem. I mean, just very briefly to, to run through. I mean, the dire conditions that exist when people arrive in Europe, it didn't actually make it explicit in the film. Until the IRC built a camp in the north of Lesbos, people were expected to walk 60 kilometers from the north of the island to the south of the island to reach the UN transit or the reg UN registration point. And these are people who have feel they've just, they didn't know whether they were going to live or die when they set out on these uh, boats. And by the way, the smugglers don't get on the boats. You rent a space on the boat, but the person who's selling you the space doesn't get on the boat with you. You're expected to drive the boat yourself. So the dire conditions that exist when people arrive are, are not difficult to fix and need to be fixed, and it shouldn't be NGOs having to step into the front line in the way that we are. Secondly, the commitment to refugees to relocate and to make sure that it's not Germany or Germany and Sweden alone bearing the burden seems to me to be an essential uh, principle that needs to be upheld. Third, the deal with Turkey needs to be extended. The deal, the $3 billion deal is a short-term deal, but it needs to be extended to Lebanon and to Jordan, and significantly, as I'll, um, well, I might as well say now, the, essentially, the old model of help for refugees, which is that you got short-term social service, and that came from the international community, and then when the war was over, you went home, that's broken down because the average refugee is out of their own country for 17 years. So the new bargain has got to be that people have got to be allowed to work in the countries that they, become, that they move to as refugees, uh, but in return, that country can't be expected to bear the whole burden. And at the moment, in a country like Jordan and Lebanon, the World Bank isn't allowed to be active because it's classified as a middle-income country. So you can understand why the Jordanians are saying, look, we've got to be really careful about how we handle this issue of economic livelihoods and, and work for refugees. You, can, you know the debate in this country uh, about that. Um, but there is a deal to be done where refugees become economically productive, but in return, the country that's hosting them gets much, much greater levels of economic uh, support. Uh, 
Uh, fourthly, we need to make a success of refugee resettlement, and I'll say a bit more about that. But when Canada can take 25,000 refugees, as they've just announced, Australia 18,000, um, we're arguing in the US that the US has to take 100,000 uh, as a substantive commitment to the people, but also as a symbolic show of solidarity with the neighbors who are bearing the greatest share of the burden. Um, and then, finally, the, the scale of civilian abuse inside Syria is a geopolitical issue, not just a humanitarian issue. Even if the war doesn't end, the way in which it's being fought is leading to untold suffering, 100 times more difficult to rebuild the country after, it's, after the war is over, but also it's contributing to the refugee flow. Now, I want to try and turn in my last uh, of, I don't know, six or seven minutes to uh, how does this relate to the report and what are the lessons. And it seems to me the first place to start is that it's not enough to have a policy response. You also have to debunk the myths. And uh, the myths are that the West bears an unfair share of the burden of refugees. In you know, fact, 86% of the world's refugees are in poor countries, not in rich countries. Myth that refugees and migrants are the same. No, they're not. Refugees have a well-founded fear of persecution. Migrants are just seeking a better life. It's not that one is good or the other is bad, but they're different. And so myth number three is that the authorities can't tell the difference between a refugee and a migrant. Fact, Europe in 2014 sent back 50,000 people because they didn't qualify as refugees. So there is a status determination test, and it is possible to tell the difference. Um, myth single men are able to look after themselves, so they shouldn't be refugees. Fact, we're publishing a report today on uh, the status of single men in Lebanon. And single men are a significant, I think they are 49% of the people arriving in Europe in the last quarter are single men. Surprise, surprise, nine out of 10 single men in Lebanon are getting no aid. The biggest driver for them to become refugees into Europe is they're getting no support in the neighboring states that they have uh, fled to. Um, myth that integration isn't practical. I mean, I now live in the US, and the evidence there is overwhelming. 150,000 Vietnamese were arriving every year in 79, 80, 81, 82. Teach English, get the kids in school, get the parents a job, get them on the path to citizenship, and you actually create productive and patriotic citizens. And of course, the bigger the numbers, the harder it is. But the better the system, the easier it is. And then I do want to make this point, because this, this is not exactly a humanitarian point, but I think it's close enough for me to make it. Myth that by withdrawing from the EU, Britain will somehow push the problems further away, the problems associated with refugee flow further away. Brexit. The, UK leaving the European Union does not change geography. It doesn't shift reality. It doesn't change the mindset of the people who are fleeing from Syria or from Afghanistan or from elsewhere. In fact, I would argue that Brexit would leave Britain more exposed, not less exposed, because it would reduce cooperation and it would make cooperation more difficult. And would actually, I think Alan Johnson's made this point really well, he, he says it would move, Brexit would move the customs post from Calais to Dover. Would actually move it 26 miles across the channel. And so the myth that by withdrawing from the EU, Britain will somehow insulate itself from these global problems seems to me absolutely untrue. Well, the myth isn't untrue, it's a myth to uh, claim that Brexit will somehow insulate uh, the UK. Now, what are the other uh, lessons? I mean, I thought it was really good that you had this up on the slide. You, you didn't talk about it, but values. Look, compassion cannot be an add-on. And that would be my way of putting it. That Ilan Kurdi could have been anyone's son. And Europe does not face a choice between values and security. It faces a choice between living up to its values or not living up to its values. Starting point. Second, though, and this is really important for my sector, the humanitarian sector, compassion without competence drains trust. Fail, if you fail to deliver on your promises, if you undermine the champions of compassion, 
then you get the trust gap. And one of the things that I'm going to say in a moment is that I think there's a real need for business and NGOs to work hard together about defining the right kind of outcomes for the humanitarian sector. Because it's got to be about corporate social results, not just corporate social responsibility. And you can show responsibility, but you need to get results. And I think that's a challenge for our sector, but one that we're embracing, and one I think it's a challenge for business too. Third, I was very pleased you put this out here. The quote unquote message is most effectively delivered not by words, but by actions of the people concerned. There are 3,500 Muslims in the US armed forces. They are the best advocates for integration in the US. And negative messages, cologne, etc., can proceed very fast. The alternative is not a lot of talking, it's a lot of doing by people who are actually uh, at the heart of it. Um, having said that, spin matters. I mean, that story about the Bataclan, quote unquote, Syrian passport that turned out to be a fake was halfway around the world before the truth got its boots on. In fact, it was all the way around the world before the truth get it, got its boots on. And a lot of people became very, very scared about something that turned out not to be true. Um, finally, I, I still have this naive belief that in the end, the public get to the truth. And so when you report that in some countries, businesses are more trusted than government, you can then ask yourself why are some of the, there's some rational reasons for that. Um, in places where government's corrupt, then people look to business to be not corrupt. Sometimes they look to armed opposition groups um, who are less corrupt than the uh, government. Uh, and I, I want to make this point too. None of us are trusted when it looks like the problems are getting worse rather than better. I mean, that's really the issue on the, global, on the European refugee crisis. We're all implicated in it in the eyes of people who are rightly looking to us to put it right. Let me just finish on um, the following point. What can you do? You're all leaders of the corporate uh, sector. Uh, we'd like you to do something. Uh, and many of you are doing things. Uh, what, what does that mean? F for, us, for those of you who've got US operations, your employees could be the best conceivable mentors to the refugees that are arriving in the US. Uh, for those of you who've got global operations, your expertise can really help us run an organization of 22,000 people when at the moment we spend 93 cents of every dollar on the front line on programs, not on the infrastructure of our organization. So at JFK last night at the airport, a uh, guy came up to me and said, um, really pleased to meet you. Um, you probably don't know this, but we're running a pro bono leadership development, managed development program for 120 middle managers in your organization. I mean, that's real help from a company that has real expertise as an HR company that really makes a difference to us. And whether you're in the law or management consultancy or supply chains, you can help us a lot. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't also say that while we want a relationship, not just a transaction, a transaction that involves donations is very important. Because we're 86% funded by governments. And governments are great partners. But they necessarily have a different approach to risk than private donors. Let me just finish with the following uh, point, which is that if I think about the big problems that um, I've been challenged with in the different jobs that I've had, whether in environment or education or economy or foreign policy, none of them get solved by one of the sectors that you've been talking about. The recipe for any problem that gets, any big problem that I've seen solved is government leadership. Anyone tells you that they can solve the problem without government leadership, I think is misleading you. Governments do need to lead, that's what they're elected to do. But they, get, they can't do it on their own. Government leadership has to be allied to business innovation. And I'd extend that, and I'd say organizational innovation, because I think NGOs can innovate strongly uh, as well. And thirdly, popular mobilization. Uh, I can't remember who it was who said that um, a foreign policy born in the minds of the few and carried in the hearts of none is doomed to fail. But it's a great notion which doesn't just apply to foreign policy. A domestic policy that is born in the hearts of the few and carried in the hearts of none is also doomed to fail. And so the, the link is government leadership, business organizational innovation, popular mobilization. And in our own small way, that's what we're trying to do at IRC with our emphasis on clear outcomes for the work we do. Not just saying we're about life changing and life saving, but actually explaining how.
how are we measuring ourselves, saying that we want all of our programs to be evidence-based or evidence-generating, so there's some quality uh, assurance built in, uh, ensuring that 90 plus percent of our staff are local staff, so they're the best broadcasters of the message locally because that's where our greatest risk is to the security of our people, and also as much transparency as possible so that we can mobilize globally. Thank you very much indeed.